Hello everyone, conversation for today is workforce focus and quality management. So an example organization, uh, Toyota Georgetown. Quote here is that uh, we've got nothing technology wise that anyone else can't have. There's no secret Toyota quality machine out there. The quality machine is in the workforce. Team members on the paint line, the suppliers, the engineers, Everyone who has a hand in production here takes the attitude that we're making world-class vehicles. And that's what it's really all about, is motivating your employees, inspiring them, making sure they have all the tools and abilities necessary in order to do their jobs. So we look at the workforce. Uh, The workforce is basically anyone who's actively involved in accomplishing the work within the organization. So you have paid employees, you might have volunteers, you have contract or temporary employees, team leaders, supervisors, managers. Um, A lot of companies refer to their employees as associates or partners to signify their part in the organization, how important they are. We even have workforce focus noted in ISO 9000. And a lot of detail here, but uh, it goes into um, what really is important in terms of standards and what organizations should be doing. Some key workforce focused uh, practices for performance excellence. Again, uh, being able to understand key factors that drive workforce engagement and having an engaged workforce, what that looks like, how to create an environment in which you have high job satisfaction, high motivation, which can lead to higher performance, Uh, designing and managing work, managing jobs, designing appropriate jobs. Um, in order to facilitate effective communication, cooperation, skill sharing, empowerment, what that looks like. So as we look at some of the details here, again, I'll let you read through these on your own. Uh, We'll be discussing a little bit more detail uh, these these key areas in terms of uh, workforce engagement. Another profile, uh, VACSP. So Veterans Affairs Cooperative Studies Program, Clinical Research Pharmacy Coordinating Center, uh, a federal government organization that supports clinical trials, targets health, current health issues for American veterans. And they see engagement as the single most important criteria for workforce satisfaction. It translates to excellence in the workplace, superior customer service, personal involvement. Another profile, ProTech coding company. And I'll try to post some uh, some more videos for you to uh, look at as well. And these should be examples um, for your case studies or for your final projects in terms of looking at an organization that is really excellent in terms of quality. Or maybe uh, looking at an organization that has some issues and then you can apply some of these examples in terms of what high performing organizations do. This particular organization is a joint venture between the United States Steel Corporation and Kobe Steel of Japan. It provided a uh, coated sheet steel primarily to the U.S. automotive industry. Culture centered around uh, fundamental concepts such as ownership, responsibility, and accountability. Um, the associates or employees work in self-directed teams, which we'll talk about. They're empowered. They're innovative. And they fix problems as they're identified, and they've learned how to do this. So as we look at the evolution of workforce management, again, we can uh, look at Frederick Taylor um, and the impact of him on quality and productivity. Uh, Taylor developed his scientific management approach, primarily to improve efficiency and productivity of manual workers. He separated planning from execution concluded that foremen and workers of those days lacked the education necessary to plan their work. The foreman's role was to ensure that the workforce met productivity standards. However, under the pressure to achieve productivity improvements, quality eroded. Labor unions became stronger and adversarial relations developed between labor and management as the push for productivity intensified. Taylor's system failed to make use of the knowledge and creativity of the workforce. Basically, he focused on more efficient way of doing things, so the best way to shovel coal. Uh, he even uh, went so far as to come up with the best way to take a shower or a bath, to be as efficient as possible. So his approach focused on improving productivity. 
but again, it really didn't look at uh, say, hey, let's ask the worker to see what would be best. So workforce management in itself consists of um, activities designed to provide for and coordinate the people of an organization. The activities include determining organization's workforce needs, assisting in the design of work systems, recruiting, selecting, training, and developing, counseling, motivating, rewarding employees, and acting as a liaison with unions and government organizations, and also handling other matters of employee well-being. Human resource managers still perform traditional tasks of personnel management, such as interviewing job applicants, negotiating contracts with unions, keeping time cards on hourly employees, and teaching training courses. But the scope and importance of their area of responsibility has changed dramatically. These managers are taking on a strategic role in their organization. They're also being required to plan for the development of the corporate culture as well as day-to-day -day operations involved with maintenance of workforce management systems. In organizations that are committed to a total quality philosophy, both the process and the content of the human resource department is rapidly changing. So as you look at strategic HR management, it's concerned with contributions of HR strategies to make organizations more effective, more efficient. Again, designing and implementing a set of consistent policies and practices to ensure that employees have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do their positions, do their jobs. High performance work culture, so we define performance, which is the extent to which an individual contributes to achieving the goals and objectives of an organization, and high performance work. So the work approach is used to systematically pursue ever higher levels of overall organizational and human performance. These are going to include flexibility, innovation, knowledge and skill sharing, and alignment with the organizational mission. So conditions of collaboration in high performing work culture would include respect, aligned values. So individuals in your organization have to be aligned with respect to values, mission, purpose, vision, communication, trust. Workforce engagement refers to the extent of workforce commitment, both emotional and intellectual, to accomplishing the work, the mission, the vision of the organization. So organizations with high levels of workforce engagement are often characterized by high-performing work environments in which people are motivated to do their, uh, do their best for the benefit of their customers and the success of the organization. Engaged workers are going to find personal meaning and motivation to their work. They're going to have an emotional bond to their company. They're going to be actively involved. They're going to be committed. They also are going to feel that their jobs are important and what they do has value. And also, it doesn't stop with just their job description. Okay, they want to go be above and beyond what it is. It's just within their, organ, their uh, job description. So advantages of workforce engagement are listed here. Engagement is also included in Deming's concept of quote-unquote pride and joy in work. It's been reflected in his 14 points. So engagement means that workers find, again, personal meaning and motivation in their work, have that bond, are actively involved. Um, and employee engagement offers many advantages over traditional management practices. So as listed here, it replaces the adversarial mentality trust and cooperation, develop skills and leadership capability of people, increases morale, fosters creativity and innovation. So you're building that competitive advantage, helping people understand their quality principles and instilling those principles into the culture. You're also allowing employees to solve problems um, immediately and improving quality and productivity. Drivers of workforce engagement include the following. A commitment to organizational values. Knowing that customers are satisfied with products and services. The belief that their opinions count. Also clearly understanding their expectations. An understanding of how personal contributions will help meet customer needs. They need to understand their value. Being recognized and rewarded fairly. Knowing that senior leaders value the workforce being treated equally and with respect, 
being able to concentrate on the job and work processes, and alignment of personal work objectives to work plans. Employee involvement refers to participative team approaches currently being applied to problem solving and decision making in various organizations. These approaches involve transforming the culture of the entire organization to tap creative energies of all employees. Employee involvement allows individuals to discover their own potential, to put that potential to work in more creative ways. People develop in themselves pride in workmanship, self-respect, self-reliance, and a heightened sense of responsibility. And a simple definition of motivation is response to a felt need. So there are three components of motivation, the felt need, the stimulus that produced the felt need, and a response to the stimulus. So it's essential for managers and team members to understand the concepts of motivation in today's quality environment. For example, Porter and Lawler model draws on expectancy theory and provides some insights into motivation, while Hackman and Oldham provide perspectives on the larger aspects of job design, which may be used to enhance quality management. So again, as we look at some different theories, we have content theories, where we have Maslow, McGregor, Hertzberg, process theories, Vroom, Porter and Lawler, Lawler, environmentally based theories with Skinner, Adams, Bandura, Snyder, and Williams. Here's a classification of motivation theories. Designing high performing work systems. So high performance work refers to work approaches used to systematically pursue ever higher levels of overall organizational and human performance. Flexibility, innovation, knowledge, skills sharing, alignment with organizational directions, customer focus, rapid response to changing business needs and marketplace requirements characterize high performance work. Organizations may be viewed at three levels. You have an individual level, process level, and an organizational level. So high performance work at the individual level should enable effective accomplishment of work activities, promote flexibility, individual initiative, and managing involving work processes. So there you'd have extensive employee involvement, empowerment, training, and education. At a process level, cooperation, teamwork, and communication are key. At the organizational level, compensation and recognition attention to employee well-being through health, safety, and support services are major factors. Work design refers to how employees are organized in formal and informal units, such as departments and teams, while job design refers to responsibilities and tasks assigned to individuals. So both are vital to organizational effectiveness and job satisfaction. Job enlargement, job rotation, and job enrichment. Job enlargement expands workers' jobs to include several tasks rather than one single low-level task. So this approach reduces what you could call fragmentation of jobs and generally res results in lower produ production costs, greater worker satisfaction, higher quality. But it also requires higher wage rates and the purchase of more inspection equipment. Job enrichment entails what you call vertical job loading. So workers are given more authority, responsibility, and autonomy rather than just simply giving them more work to do. They support the Hackman and Oldman model as they relate to the core job characteristics of skill variety and autonomy. So these characteristics relate to their critical psycho psychological states and outcomes shown in the model. So when we talk about enlargement, you're giving people more work to do. When you're talking about enrichment, you're giving them more responsibility. You're giving them more authority, more decision-making capability. So the Hackman-Oldman model. The model proposes five characteristics of job design as mentioned here. You have task significance, task identity, skill variety, autonomy, and feedback from the job. So it can be used to design motivation, motivating potential into a job. 
Your approach to task design helps to explain motivational properties of tasks by tying together human and technical components of jobs. So again, five core job characteristics are mentioned here. For example, the job of a data entry operator in a computer center was formally designed using specialized pool concepts where operators just received work assigned at random from all departments. Groups of operators were designed or designated to enter data while others did nothing but maybe verify or rekey information to check for accuracy. High error rates, low productivity, absenteeism, turnover were, expect, were experienced at the center. When the jobs were redesigned using Hackman and Oldman's concepts, they saw improvement in quality, productivity, and measures of employee satisfaction. The redesign involved cross-training on data entry and verification skills for all operators, assignment of work from individual departments to specific operators, and more control over work elements. So that provided for a greater feeling of task identity and significance, an opportunity for greater use of skills, more autonomy and feedback from customers and the departments that sent work to them. Empowerment. When we discuss empowerment, you're giving people authority to make decisions. Again, based on what they feel is right, as they have more control over their work. They're able to take risks. They're able to learn from mistakes, and that helps promote change. So you're giving people that ability, but you have to trust people. So successful empowerment is going to include these things. Again, it simply means giving people authority to make uh, the authority and power to make decisions. With that, employees are provided education, resources, and encouragement to do so. Policies and procedures are examined for uh, restrictions that uh, employees might have. You, you're fostering an, an atmosphere of trust, and you're not going to punish people for failure. Information is going to be shared freely. Workers should feel that their efforts are desired and needed for the success of the organization. And um, managers need to adopt kind of a hands-off leadership style. With respect to teams, team is defined as a small number of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, set of performance goals, and performance and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. Teams provide opportunities to individuals to solve problems that they may not be able to solve on their own. Teams may perform a variety of problem-solving activities and may also assume many traditional managerial functions. Effective teams are goal-centered, independent, open, supportive, and empowered. Most common types of teams are management teams, natural work teams, self-managed teams, virtual teams, quality circles, problem-solving teams, and project teams. Management teams consist mainly of managers from various functions, such as sales and production, that coordinate work among teams. Natural work teams are organized to perform entire jobs rather than specialized assembly line work. Self-management teams, otherwise known as SMTs, they're specifically empowered work teams defined as a, a highly trained group of employees, usually from 6 to 18 people. Um, they're fully responsible for turning out a well-defined segment of finished work. Again, also known as self-directed work teams. Virtual teams is kind of new, which team members communicate by um, basically computer or Skype. You know, they take turns as leaders and jump in and out as necessary. So these types of teams use a combination of internet, email, phone, video conferencing, whatever is needed to uh, share information and get their jobs done. Quality circles are teams of workers and supervisors that meet regularly to address work-related problems involving quality and productivity. Problem-solving teams are teams whose members gather to solve a specific problem and then disband somewhat of a task force, they have a mission. Project teams are teams with a specific mission to develop something new or to accomplish a complex task.
Here's some examples of teams at Baptist Hospital where uh, they have uh, divided up into people, service, quality, financial, and growth. Team skill requirements include these, being able to handle conflict and resolution. Again, team management, leadership skills, decision-making skills, communication, negotiation, and cross-cultural training as well. Understanding that not everybody is like you. Look at the life cycle of teams. Teams go through several very predictable phases of development called forming, storming, norming, and performing. Forming is when the team is introduced, meets together, and explores issues of the new, new assignment. Storming occurs when team members disagree on team roles and challenge the way that the team will function. The third stage, norming, takes place when the issues of the previous stage have been worked out and team members agree on roles ground rules, and acceptable behavior when doing the work of a team. Stage four, performing, is a productive phase of the life cycle when team members cooperate to solve problems and complete the goals of their assigned work. And then the adjourning phase is when the team wraps up the project. They complete their goals and they prepare to disband or move on to another project. With respect to ingredients for successful teams, are listed here. Again, first of all, teams have to have clear goals. Teams issues have to be considered, pitfalls have to be avoided, teams are being, going to be successful. So the team structure depends heavily on cooperation, communication, and clarity. Um, study estimates that about 60% of failures of Six Sigma teams are due to failures in mechanics of team operations, as opposed to poor project selection or improper use of tools. So there's contributing factors for failures, such as lack of application of meeting skills, improper use of agendas, failure to determine meeting roles and responsibilities. Any of those sound so simple, but they lead to team failure. The organization also has to consider a number of issues relating to employee well-being in today's work environment too. With respect to health, safety, and overall well-being, uh, making accommodations for workers with disabilities, protection of employees from sexual harassment, and quality of workplace factors. Latter category now includes such factors as personal and career counseling, career development, employability services, recreational or cultural activities, daycare, special leave for family, responsibilities, or community services, flexible work hours, outplacement services, extended health care for retirees. So what does that workplace environment look for? If you look at some of the most admired companies in the U.S., and take a look at the list, you can Google it, um, you'll, you'll find that uh, a lot of these companies provide a work environment um, that uh, looks after their employees in some outstanding ways, whether it be outstanding health care, having cafeterias on campus that are free, free food for everybody. Google is like that on their campus. Or maybe even providing free transportation to and from the workplace. Uh, Google has all of those, plus they have uh, laundry facilities on site. They have daycare, subsidized. Um, you know, there's a number of companies like that to provide an environment which people want to go to work and they're taken care of as well as being free from uh, harassment, and it's a safe and productive environment. Workplace learning and development. Again, research shows that companies that spend heavily on training their workers outperform companies that spend less. If you watch the video on PAL Sudden Service, maybe you caught the, uh, the quote in which the, uh, the owner and founder mentioned, or he was asked, uh, you know, what if you spend all this money on trading and your employees leave? And he responded, well, what if I don't and they stay? All right? So, um, again, there's, there's a trade-off there. And, you know, you look at your return on your investment that you're getting. You focus on both what people need to know as well as the things they need to know how to do. This idea of continual reinforcement and knowledge.
compensation and recognition. Compensation is uh, referred or in recognition refers to all aspects of pay and reward, including promotions, bonuses, recognition, either monetary and non-monetary, uh, or individual and group. And compensation tends to be a sticky issue, closely tied to subject motivation, employee satisfaction. Money is a motivator when people are at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, pay for performance can diminish intrinsic motivation. It causes most employees to believe they're being treated unfairly and forces managers to deliver negative messages. Eventually, it creates win-lose situations. The objectives of a good compensation system should be to attract, retain, and not demotivate employees. Other objectives include reducing unexplainable variation in pay, encouraging internal cooperation rather than competition. Most companies still use traditional financial measures such as gro revenue growth, profitability, and cost management as a basis for compensation. More progressive organizations use quality measures such as customer satisfaction, defect prevention, cycle time reduction to make compensation decisions. Um, many quality focused companies now base compensation on the market rate for an individual with proven capabilities. They make adjustments as capabilities are increased, along with enhanced responsibilities, seniority, and business results. Many companies link compensation to company track records, unit performance, team success, individual achievement, team-based pay, and gain sharing, which is an approach in which all employees share savings equally or gaining in popularity and importance. We look at effective recognition and reward strategies. Again, some key pieces to that. Key practices, giving both individual and team awards. So involving everyone, including both frontline employees and senior management, tying rewards to quality based on measurement objectives, rewarding for behavior, not just results allowing peers and customers to nominate recognize superior performance, publicizing team and individual recognition extensively, making recognition fun. Okay, so in managing quality, it's important to separate <coughs> individual compensation from uh, pay, and, pay and promotion from performance appraisal. One way to do this is through gain sharing, where employees, regardless of rank, share savings equally. Another way to separate compensation from performance is to have pay tied closely to the acquisition of new skills. So maybe you have a continuous improvement program in which all employees are given opportunities to broaden their, their, uh, their skill base. So performance appraisals, uh, they're, they're difficult workforce management activities to perform. Um, there's many of them out there, um, and uh, again, there's no, well, the conventional school says that a formal process is necessary and desirable, but can be improved upon. If you follow Deming, uh, his school says that a formal process is unnecessary and should be eliminated due to flaws in the process. So there are anti-appraisal supporters out there. But there are many different kinds of appraisals as well. So. There's no right answer, <coughs> but there are different methods, and uh, they should be focused on uh, key factors, and they should be effective. Performance appraisals are most effective in a quality environment when they're based on the objectives of the teams, the objectives of the organization. Everybody needs to understand what their goals are. They need to have specific goals in which they can reach and they can be measured on. Um, there's 360 feedback methods that are out there now too, in which you're not only being appraised by your boss, but you may also be appraised or receive feedback from your coworkers and from anybody else you interact with in the organization. So these are somewhat popular too. So let's say that uh, every six months or a year you receive feedback. Not only are you going to meet with your boss, you're going to receive feedback from your boss and anybody else who you interact with on your team. Maybe it could be some of your peers uh, in the organization. It could be customers that you have. Or also, 
customers internally to your business as well as outside the business. So you're receiving feedback from all these different touch points, which could be more valuable to you. Again, we have uh, measurement of workforce engagement, employee satisfaction, and how that's needed to assess the link with company strategy, provide a foundation for improvement. So outcome measurements can be made of cost savings, productivity improvements, cycle time reductions, customer satisfaction levels, employee turnover, and then these can be applied to areas such as team and overall organizational progress or effectiveness suggestion processes. Process measures, so for example, the number of suggestions that employees make, the numbers of participants in the project teams, all this would be included. Measuring workforce engagement, you have the Gallup Q12, which is a survey instrument for employee engagement. It includes 12 survey statements that Gallup found as those that best form the foundation of strong feelings of engagement. These include factors like knowing what's expected in one's work, having the right materials and equipment to do the job, receiving recognition and feedback on progress and development, having opinions that count, feeling of importance of the job, and opportunities to learn, grow, and develop. Sustaining high performance work systems. Again, this is a regular assessment of workforce capability, hiring, training, retention of employees, even looking at career progression and succession planning too, which is very important. Workforce capability refers to an organization's ability to accomplish its work processes through the knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies of the people within its organization. Capability may include or may include the ability to build and sustain relationships with customers, to innovate and transition to new technologies, develop new products, services, work processes, the ability to be innovative, to meet changing business, market, and regulatory demands. Workforce capacity refers to an organization's ability to ensure sufficient staffing levels. So where are you going to find the work, workforce that you need? and uh, successfully delivering products and services to customers. The ability to meet seasonal or varying demand levels. So workforce capability and capacity should consider not only current needs, but also future requirements based on strategic objectives and action plans. So it's important to consider both capability and capacity when you're designing a high performance work system. Effective hiring practices. Determining key employee skills and competencies. So who is needed, what skills are needed, not only now, but also in the future. And are you going to be able to, where are you going to find these candidates? So for example, some organizations might start developing a pipeline, either with a local high school or a local college. And you're trying to identify job candidates based on required skills and competencies. You're screening them too, to find the best, uh, best people to match jobs. And and a part of this is also keeping an eye on the environment. Statistics right now show that by 2018, there's going to be a shortage of people with bachelor's degrees. Uh, jobs that may not have required, or may have required only a high school education 10 years ago, now require an associate's or even a bachelor's degree. So if that's the case, um, you know, how is an organization going to find those people needed? You, know, you look at the retiring of the baby boomer generation. That's a huge hit to the workforce. How are you going to replace all those people? Developing relationships with higher education organizations, uh, developing pipelines. I think it's Chabot College out in Hayward has a, a program uh, which um, they have an associates program, but you, you can also get your, uh, it's a partnership with BMW, in which graduates receive their um, uh, tech certification as well as an associates degree when they graduate. So they'll be uh, qualified to work at dealerships, BMW dealerships, when they graduate, and they'll have their uh, certificate certification to do so. 
so those employees can work in any dealership within the U.S. So that is a pipeline they've developed. Succession planning. So what's your plan uh, to replace people who are in leadership positions or even just positions, um, everyday positions that are important as well? So mentoring, coaching, job rotation, how can you replace people? How are you going to find, um, find somebody else to do that job once the other person leaves?